South Orange Avenue and South 10th Street is a tough intercity intersection in Newark. This is a place kids can come if they want to buy the highly addictive form of cocaine, crack. You just come up here with your money and ask who got it. And when you see the person who got it, you pay for it and go about your business. Throw it in your little, throw it in your little pipe and just... <laughs> you know, tell them about it. Roast it up. You roast it up. That's crack right there. there. Yeah, ain't no caps. Crack has received a lot of attention lately, but it is only one form of cocaine, and the inner city is not the only place where kids are getting strung out on coke. Tommy Hill rocking ice niggas. Tommy Hill ice rocking niggas. Fuck. Mira. Take a one on one to this shit, y'all. Yeah. Get your nostrils yeah. clear. Come on. Sniff your brains out, all my Al Capone, Al Pacino niggas. Yeah. Damn a drug smuggling. Capadonna. Golden arms. Yo, yo, check out the rap kingpin, the black Jesus. I know a few niggas sniff coke in core seasons. Peace to half moon seasons. And all the bitches in the bleachers. Hot weather sex on the beaches. Jury shopping out of the country. Deluxe luxury. People saying them not changed. Look, truck on me. But what about the Wonder Woman bracelet? 2.3 diamond cutting gray boobies. Kid, I laced it. My sweet tooth got a nigga throbbing. Ready for robbing. But first, hit Maria's for a butter almond. The bionic microphone to smack mechanic. Move like a bunch of Mexicans with bandanas. Sun is on. So we can just max a million. I got the spot on so we can make a billion. Nearly one in five New Jersey high school students have tried cocaine. Good evening, I'm Larry Stupnagel. Health experts agree that the use of cocaine by young people has reached epidemic proportions. Right now, I'm in Morristown, but I could be anywhere in New Jersey because cocaine is used everywhere. For the next half hour, we'll examine this problem, and then we'll go back to our studio where you can call some experts if you have a question about the drug, or get some advice if you have a cocaine problem. Now, let's meet some of New Jersey's cocaine kids. I was six and a half, and I started smoking marijuana in grade school. Just um, occasional kind of thing. And then about the age of eight and a half, nine is when I got more into it. It was like weekends and parties and stuff like that, you know. It was all free back then. I knew kids who were older, and it, it was like a joke, you know, because he was this little kid who liked to get high. I did cocaine for about seven years. The first time, coming up on my 10th birthday, about nine and a half, um, it was just something that I ran into one day, and I tried it, and I loved it. And um, in the beginning, it, it was just a line here, a line there. And up to this past March, I was using in the area two and a half to three grams a day, um, snorting, injection, whatever. I was used by injection for two years, starting when I was about 14 and a half. Jim lives with his mom, dad, and two brothers in an upper middle class neighborhood in Morristown. At 17, he's a recovering cocaine addict. Once you do it, you want more, and you don't want to stop. At least for me it was, you know, once once I caught the buzz, that, that initial rush, especially if if you shoot it, you can just feel the surge of power as your, as your veins go cold. And then you spend the rest of the day or the week or however long you're at it trying to get that initial rush. We call it the chase and the dragon. That's a, that's a saying that comes on the street, trying to get the initial rush. Why did you inject the cocaine? I was having sinus problems from snorting. And um, I was in the city one time, and I just I ran into this method I'd heard about shooting up for all, all this thing, and, and somebody just said, try it, it don't hurt. It's like getting blood taken. So I tried it, and it didn't hurt. And it was quicker. It cost less because it used less, and the effects lasted longer. Where did you get the needles? That's, 
it's very easy on the street, really. I mean, I could go into a pharmacy and steal 100 insulin needles. I could go into galleries on the Lower East Side, and, you know, for, for five bucks you could pick up a clean work, or you could use somebody else's dirty one and just heat it up and throw some alcohol on it. In Newark and other cities, any kid can afford crack. It only costs between 10 and $20 a vial, but that's only one reason it's so popular. One, it's it, the process of getting high is accelerated. People are getting high fast in a minute. Uh, they inhale it, it goes straight to the brain, and it's an automatic euphoria. Two, the process involved in getting crack to its cracked form, to its hard and rock form, is one that is also very habit forming. So more people are, are hooked on romancing the stone, if you will. Kids say the high from crack sends them soaring. It's fly. It's what? It's fly. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's fly. I ain't gonna lie. It ain't like I'm addicted to it or I need it, but I tried it. Yeah. It's good. It's good to go, but you gotta have the money for it. You don't got the money for it, you can't have it. Because all you do is want more. You can but, smoke 20 bottles and you still want more. Always gonna want some more. But it's only, it, it ain't in a whole, it ain't, what? It ain't a whole lot of... It? Yeah. Uh-huh. But um, I'm not into it because I sell it. I'm trying to make money. You know, so I can't do it too much. I smoke. I'm strong. I can smoke one bottle, and that's it. You know what I'm saying? To Councillor Carl Grimes, those comments reflect deeper problems in the community. I don't think uh, years ago you would have found that many kids in their own neighborhoods uh, ready to stand in front of reporters and or anybody that, that symbolized any kind of authority and say what they had to say. First of all, they'd have been afraid of their parents seeing them. They would have been afraid to admit that they used. Uh, so this whole scene is also symbolic of a breakdown of authority, breakdown of family. A breakdown of total and complete respect for everybody and, and, and including themselves. Jim says he sold cocaine to support his habit. He claims he could sell $3,000 worth a week. I could move on the average day seven, eight hundred dollars just in high school and then out on the street. It's, it's unbelievable, the demand, especially if you get down towards Newark, down towards, um, out towards Hoboken, out towards Washington Square Park. I knew people in there. Everywhere, the demand is there. Wherever you go, there's always people looking to get high. Jim's mother remembers how she felt when his school counselor called to say he needed treatment. Well, I felt like the bottom had fallen out from under me. I was at work. Uh, the only thing I could think of is it must be similar to when you hear the news that somebody very close has died. But didn't you ever feel that he's been using drugs for so long? How could I have not noticed? I felt that a lot. Uh, I still do. It's the one thing that's the hardest to answer. And I wasn't working at that time. I was going to school at nights, a couple of nights a week. But I was basically home. And I'll never understand that, except that I know they're very good. They're slick. Addicts are the best manipulators and con artists there are. It's incredible. And you'll hear this from every parent. They're slick. State officials estimate that 17% of New Jersey's high school students have tried cocaine at least once. And it's a drug people return to. We had statistics from 10 years ago that 10% of young people had admitted using it once during the past year. They just did a follow-up after 10 years. Now, they're 27 now. 40% had admitted use of cocaine during the past year. So what they're starting to learn in school, they're passing through to college and into the workplace as young executives or young assembly line workers. I was always craving coke. And it's like, you just felt like you need it to do anything you know, to function, just to get, you know, through little things like school, parties and stuff. You just, I'd always feel like I needed it and I had to have it and I'd find a way to have it no matter what. Girls as well as boys get hooked on cocaine. 17-year-old Sherry had a $600 a week habit she supported by selling marijuana and speed. You'll do anything to get it. You'll steal. I know people that have, you know, been involved in prostitution and stuff just to get it. I would never Kids do that. Kids that went to your school? No, not in my school, but um, there's just people I know that have done it. And I mean, I know people that have stolen cars, broken into houses. You find a lot of people like that here. 
you know, that have done just about anything to get it. We met Sherry while she was undergoing rehabilitation at the Carrier Foundation in Bell Mead. I just got really paranoid when I was high on coke. And that was scary. And it's scary to know that you're addicted and that you can't stop. How did your parents take this? Very well. I was surprised. When I told them that I wanted to come in here for inpatient treatment, they, um, they were really upset and they didn't believe it at first because they never really picked up any clues. You know, they didn't know what to look for and they had no idea. They thought I'd used it once or twice, but they didn't think I was doing it every day. Kids in grade school are now being exposed to cocaine, but the drug is claiming even younger victims. This tiny girl, born three months premature, is struggling for life. She weighed just one pound, one ounce at birth. Her mother told doctors at the Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center in New York that she used cocaine during her pregnancy. You don't like that at all, do you? The infant's eyes, lungs, kidneys, and brain development were all damaged by her early birth. Kids like her are born in New Jersey, but New York City hospitals keep better records of drug-addicted mothers. And the use of cocaine by drug-using women has jumped from 25% five years ago to 75% today. And the mothers often mix the cocaine with other drugs like heroin and methadone. Only hours after they're born, these kids begin to suffer. They're going through the pain of drug withdrawal. Some tremors, jitteriness, hyperactivity, high pitch to cry, and if it gets severe, then severe tremors, they may vomit, they may have abdominal distension, they may develop diarrhea, they may develop convulsions as well. So severe withdrawal symptoms can kill the baby. Most of the time, the infant will survive, but they do not respond to touch and love like normal babies. These babies, when they develop withdrawal symptoms, they increase muscle tones. They have increased muscle tones. And as you hold the baby, normal full-term babies will cuddle you, hug into you, so that you have, not only you give love, but you have feeling of returning love to you. But when you hold these babies with increased muscle tones, they resist so that mothers may have a rejection feeling from the baby. These babies do not hug, do not cuddle onto you. So that there is uh, emotional problems from the beginning. Experts say many women believe cocaine will not harm their developing child, but it can cause spontaneous abortions or birth defects. When we first met Mary, she was entering her ninth month of pregnancy. An addict, she had smoked cocaine until her seventh month. Freebasing is, um, I was freebasing with this baby. And uh, freebasing is harder to stop. It's more like an obsession than anything else. So the snorting was easy, but the freebasing was really, you know, hard because it was more addictive. Someone watching this interview, though, is going to be listening to what you're telling me and say, she's pregnant. How could she do this to her child? Oh, I knew I was harming my child, but the obsession was greater than the, uh, the drive to stop. You know, uh, once you're addicted to something, it's just not that simple to put it down. I mean, I went through all kinds of changes trying to control it. But she did control her craving for freebasing. Mary said that after she quit, she noticed her fetus became more active. Her son was born healthy and with no signs of withdrawal. But doctors say that's because withdrawal happened while he was still in his mother's womb. And drug counselors face the dilemma of finding a place to send the financially poor, cocaine-addicted woman. More inpatient facilities, residential treatment areas. That's what we need right now. We're very limited in what we have and referrals that we can make. Where can you send someone right now? Right now, there's no place in New Jersey that we can send someone who is pregnant and needs long-term care. Mary has been drug-free for nine months, and her son is fine, but she takes one day at a time because of one big fear. Going back out. That's the greatest fear of all, picking up thinking that I have control of something that I didn't control then, I never will control. 
and misleading myself into believing that, oh, if I go out today and use today, I got control of this. You know, I can use just now and put it down. That's my biggest fear, getting weak and picking up a drug. Law enforcement officials say it's easy to pick up drugs in New York, especially crack, and bring it into New Jersey. So the authorities are cracking down. In one recent coordinated assault, police in Passaic, Mercer, and Atlantic counties arrested 222 alleged dealers in what was called the state's largest single sweep of street-level pushers. 104 of those arrests were for crack. Some of the undercover sales were made in the schoolyard in Passaic. The sale of the drugs to minors sparked calls for the death penalty in the state Senate. Senator Frank Graves introduced legislation mandating a five-year prison sentence for dealers who sell to young people. But he regretted the punishment could not be stiffer. And the most unscrupulous, reprehensible people that God ever created are those that are making these drugs available to our kids. Senator Caulfield said, and I agreed with him, I wish we could get enough support to bury them alive or hang them in front of City Hall. I would like to do it myself, and I wouldn't hesitate to do it. The Senate approved Graves' bill unanimously. It's now in the Assembly, where both parties recently unveiled anti-drug bills. And Speaker Chuck Hardwick drafted emergency legislation to recruit more foot soldiers in the war on drugs. His $4 million bill would hire 100 additional police officers for Newark to crack down on crack. Some may say, but what about other cities? They need money to fight crack too. I say, if we can't control crack in our largest city, as we must do, then other cities and suburbs may well be lost to this menace. We must begin somewhere. Hardwick's bill passed unanimously and is in the Senate. In Newark and elsewhere, people are rallying against crack and other drugs. They're saying they're fed up with narcotics and pushers. Down will go, up will ho. Down will go, up will ho. Anyone caught selling drugs in or around any of our schools, we want the mandatory life prison term for them now. But are more police and stiffer penalties the answer to stopping the epidemic of drug abuse? Attorney General Kerry Edwards says the problem is too big for law enforcement to tackle alone. So we have to be careful we don't put uh, some quick fix, paint some magic picture for the public and say, don't worry anymore, it's all fixed. Uh, we can't let them believe that law enforcement can solve a problem of the magnitude that this is. Uh, if there's 50,000 drug pushers out there on the streets of the state, uh, we only have 14,000 jail cells. The administration is proposing to improve the coordination of existing services, toughen some laws, and increase public awareness of drugs to wage a long-term war against abuse. If we try to deal with it with a magic wand and say, whoosh, this will fix it, uh, we're only kidding the public. It needs to be comprehensive and sustained. But how do you convince kids not to use cocaine or other drugs? A South Jersey program called Operation Aware teaches grade schoolers values and how to deal with their feelings. So hopefully they won't want to experiment if someone offers them something. What were the reasons people just put down? Just reviewing? This sixth grade class is receiving a lesson in how to deal with peer pressure. Why does someone use a put down on you? To make you do something? That something could include drugs. Operation Aware teachers, who have been trained at the Drink Memorial Guidance Center in Burlington, visit classrooms in Ocean, Camden, Gloucester, Atlantic, Burlington, and Cumberland counties. Students in the fourth to sixth grades receive lessons for up to 20 weeks. The message we're trying to get across to youngsters is that they don't have to do what they perceive the group thinks is cool if it hurts them, hurts someone else, or breaks the law. But how successful do you think you'll be? This is an age when kids want to experiment. That's right. It is natural to want to experiment. I think one of the reasons why Operation Aware is successful is because every child on a grade level is included in the program. It's not one of those things where they're pulled out of a class because they seem to have a problem. Uh, and in doing that, when the entire peer group in that class or that school receives the same information, the impact has the power to change what the entire group thinks is cool. I'm going to try my hardest to stay straight because I don't want to get back into that again. 
I'm going to try really hard to stay straight. But what about the kids who are already hooked? Recently, a Senate committee heard that New Jersey is woefully lacking in juvenile treatment centers. Of the estimated 50 to 60,000 youths with problems, only 375, aged 11 to 17, are being treated on a daily basis. Annually, 1,200 to 1,500 adolescents in New Jersey go out of state for residential drug treatment due to the lack of residential drug treatment programs in the state of New Jersey. Most of these adolescents are covered by insurance coverage. Thus, the indigent and working poor are the ones that are excluded. They're the ones that cannot go out of state for treatment, and they're the ones, unfortunately, that do not get treatment. It was two years ago that State Senator Donald DeFrancesco introduced a $2 million bill to set up adolescent treatment centers in New Jersey. I really have had trouble getting it moving. It's been released from one committee. It's now in appropriations. However, I'm very uh, much uh, optimistic about it now because, as you know, uh, people are now starting to focus on the substance abuse problem among adolescents. We need the facilities now, and they're desperately needed by our adolescents. You have to get in touch with your feelings and realize that you're powerless over your drug. And you just have to want it for yourself. You have to want to get straight. If you don't want it, then you're not going to. You're going to slip again. But even with the best treatment, cocaine is a hard drug to quit. Only 30% of the people who are on the drug successfully stop using. Jim has been through two treatment programs in six months. After his first treatment, he made a deal with his family not to use cocaine again. When he broke the agreement, his family made a painful decision. The time, our contract was that he could not live in this house if he was not clean. And he came home that night uh, high, and uh, Jamie and I talked about it a few minutes, followed our contract, and we called the police. Jim spent the night in a hospital. Shortly thereafter, he began his second rehabilitation. The cost of the two programs, $26,000. How will his family feel if he uses cocaine again? I'll be very hurt. I'd be very disappointed. Um, he would not be able to live here. I would probably say he would have to go to a halfway house. I, I don't know if we're ready to pay for another rehab. We have two other children in colleges coming up soon. And you begin to wonder, you know, how much money are you going to pour into rehab if he doesn't really want to make it? Uh, one thing we've been learning is he has to take responsibility for his actions and for his recovery. And if he really wants it, he'll make it work day at a time. Are there any telltale signs of drug use they wish they had noticed and they can share with others? Like I said, the things I attributed to age, adolescence, behavior is one of the biggest symptoms. Uh, the kids tend to have trouble getting up in the morning. They, you'll find them in their room alone, sleeping in the daytime. Their sleeping patterns change. They withdraw to an extent. They want to be in their room if they're home or listen to their music. Maybe the music gets more far out. Uh, they tend to get more rebellious. Somebody says, like, my nice little angel all of a sudden went to bed one night as an angel and woke up like a devil. I mean, I've heard people say this. It was just like a totally different person. And whether the young cocaine user comes from a wealthy, middle class, or poor background, the stakes are the same. The real issue is, uh, is that we're losing our young. We're losing our warriors. We're losing the people who can change things. Uh, and, and if they don't have it within themselves to stop, and they don't have it within themselves to pull themselves up by, them, by their bootstraps, then it's our job to get to them and do some work with them. You don't know what cocaine will do to you. Once you find out and know the effects of it, you leave it alone. It's destroying. That's all. It's just destroying. I don't want it. I got one son that's 14. I don't want it to touch him. I wish I could have gotten out of it sooner and didn't have to travel the road. You know, I just wanted to, to do a little experiment, and, and I just ended up falling in love with it. And I just pursued it. It's not worth the pain. I mean, it took me a long time to hurt. There was hurt involved, but it took me the better part of 10 years to get really hurt and to the point where I wanted out. I think pain is the best motivator for an addict because it wouldn't happen to me. And then when it did and I started to hurt, then I took action. Jim will spend the rest of his life, one day at a time, trying to escape the pain he got from cocaine. 
And welcome now to the call-in portion of Cocaine Kids. I have with me now a panel of experts who can answer your questions about the drug or offer some suggestions if you have a cocaine problem. Joining us tonight is Dr. Philip Torrance of the Carrier Foundation in Bell Mead, Matt Martin of the New Jersey Health Department, and Nathan Fears of Fair Oaks Hospital in Summit, New Jersey. Now, if you have a question that you would like answered, you can call us toll-free. The number is 1-800-722-6588. That's 1-800-722-6588. Gentlemen, I want to thank you all for being with us this evening. And I guess the question that's on everybody's mind with this particular drug, with any drug, but particularly with cocaine, since it is now the drug of choice in the country, is how do you keep kids away from cocaine? Can you keep kids away from cocaine? Uh, ask that to each one of you. We'll start with Dr. Torrance. Well, I think your documentary certainly pointed out very clearly uh, <clears throat> that it's out there. Um, one has to work with families. Um, uh, to try and help them recognize uh, when they need to step in to help a kid. One hopes that the school system can step in and help. One hopes that other organizations that the kids are involved in can step in and help. But as your documentary pointed out very clearly, uh, there isn't any easy answer to that. Mr. Fierce? One of the main themes or ways of preventing young people from experimenting with cocaine is early education. And that starts even before young people are in elementary school. There are some programs in the, in the country now that are focusing on kids when they're four and five years old. And that's a major way to prevent young people to educate them early. Mr. Martin. Larry, sometimes I think it's the community almost has to take over the streets. And that's often done when law enforcement and school people start cooperating and start sharing information and parents get involved. Parents need to be much more aware and they have to be talking to each other and they have to have some of the skills needed to uh, really to deal with the young kids. Well, once again, the phone number that people can call if you have a question for anyone here. It's 1-800-722-6588. Now, we've been talking about parental awareness here. Uh, some of the signs that we heard from Jamie in our documentary are those, are those, is that pretty common? Because all of the kids that I talked to when I was working on this, all of the kids said, my parents never suspected anything was wrong. Is that, is it, is that that common, Dr. Torrance? I think that's true. I think the kids have uh, pointed that out um, quite accurately. Um, probably the best sign that a kid is involved in drugs is, is subtle changes in the kid's capacity to deal with uh, family, school, friends. Uh, he starts narrowing his repertoire of uh, behaviors. He becomes less flexible, less adaptive, more irritable. Parents don't always see that. They don't always know what they could do. If they do see it, they have almost as great a need sometimes to deny what's going on as the kid has to deny it's a problem because it's very frightening and they're not sure there's help. I think the, the best step there is to step in and let them know there's help available, let them be able to notice it. Okay, we have our first call right now. Uh, Philip from Morristown, go ahead, please. Hello, this is uh, Philip from Morristown, and I have a question on this parent. I'm concerned that Jim's mother was stating the fact that uh, teenagers are very crafty and sly in the use of cocaine, and it may be evasive from the standpoint of parents noticing some of the behavioral patterns that affect uh, these children that aren't immediately noticed by their parents. I was hoping you might be able to comment on this aspect. Which one of you would like to tackle that problem? Uh, Mr. Fears, why don't you go ahead? Well, I think as we were talking about previously that um, Symptomology is real difficult to note for some families. Um, basically, the parents are into a state of denial. They don't want to admit or look at the fact that um, their son or daughter may be involved with chemicals. Um, basically, when we have young people come into the hospital, one of the things we focus on is having them break through some of that denial, not only the, per the young individual, but also the family. And you will see twice or three times the amount of drug use um, than the family previously knew about when that young person first um, hinted that he might have a chemical dependency problem. Dr. Torrance, I think that question also followed up a little bit with what we were discussing earlier. I think it's important to point out that um, I think kids are sly and uh, manipulative because they're desperate. Uh, they're just as desperate as the parents are. And uh, 
both the parents and the kid are doing the best they can under the circumstance, and it requires some help so that they don't have to be sly and manipulative. All right, we have another caller now. Charles from Willingboro, go ahead. Uh, hello? Yes, go ahead, Charles. Yes, my question is, I'm concerned as to the, the hype of this cocaine problem. Uh, I personally do not, have never used the drug or even tried it, but my concern is, is this an overhype? The media has gotten a hold to this and sort of blown it out of proportion. Um, is cocaine crack, is it as bad as they really say it is? Is it that addictive? Well, I'll let uh, Matt Martin tackle that one from the health department since he has a statewide look at the problem. I think we have to separate crack and cocaine because admissions in this state since 1980, our admissions for treatment have gone from 2% up to 21%. They went from 15% last year to 21% this year. Now, the 6% in the last year is probably very much the crack epidemic, but cocaine has been with us for the past decade and just, just increasing, so I don't think it's a hype. Now, you're seeing so much today about crack, that's a separate issue in a sense. It's the, the whole expansion of the cocaine trade, but I don't think it's a hype when it's really something destroying our nation. Charles, just one follow-up as the reporter who covered this story, and that is I focused on cocaine because nationwide studies have shown that while drug use of other drugs has actually gone down, the use of cocaine has increased dramatically. And so that's why the focus of this particular story was on cocaine. So I don't feel that I'm feeding into any hype or any sort of sensationalism here. The drug is being used. It is becoming more and more the drug of choice of young people and uh, as Matt said in the documentary, as people get started with it, it's something that they like to stay with. We're going to have to take a 60-second break. Before we do that, I want to give you the phone number one more time. It's 1-800-722-6588. That's 1-800-722-6588. We're going to take a 60-second break. We'll be right back to take more of your calls. Stay with us. Welcome back to the call-in portion of the Cocaine Kids documentary. Uh, right now we have Pam from Morristown standing by. Pam, go ahead with your question. All right, we're probably having, or it sounds like we're having some problems there. The other issue that I think that comes up a lot when, all right, well, Peggy from Pleasantville, I guess you're here. So, Peggy, go ahead with your question. Hello? Peggy, yes, go ahead. This is Bessie. Okay, go ahead, Bessie. Okay, I wanted to know if there's any uh, rehabilitations that are free, charged that you can go to to get help? Mr. Martin, I'll let you take that. Well, most of the outpatient facilities in the state are basically f free for people. There's some small costs, some small added costs, but they're basically free. In fact, a few years ago, they were completely free. And in residential care, there may be some initial monies for the entrance and so forth, say $100, $150, but that is government funded, so basically that's free after that. You could call the, the hotline number to get the nearest facility, but um, okay, I'll, free. And I will have that hotline number at the end of the program. If you want to jot it down right now, it's the New Jersey Drug Hotline. It's 1-800-225-0196. That's 1-800-225-0196. Okay, Jim, uh, you're standing by on the line. Go ahead. Yes, hello? Yes, go ahead, Jim. Uh, as a former uh, school teacher and also a recovering cocaine addict, I think I have a unique perspective, and I'd like to address uh, my remarks and question to uh, whichever member of your panel there is involved in uh, educational programs within the school. I'm sorry, who who would that be? I think well, uh, I think all of us, all of us. Can, okay. can address that issue. Um, you know, from what I saw in the documentary, the uh, issues that are being discussed with the kids in the classrooms are, uh, they seem to be rather specious to me, and uh, they don't really get to the point. I mean, what's the sense of a clinical discussion of cocaine or, or, or peer pressure? I don't think that's why people get fascinated with drugs. I think they get uh, fascinated with drugs because it's a romantic uh, endeavor, and when you merely uh, discuss some of the attributes of uh, the effects of getting high and, you know, watch out, this guy is going to try to sell you some drugs and these are the symptoms. I, I don't see that getting uh, to the heart of why kids make the decision to get high for the first time. 
Well, the point, just speaking for Operation Aware now, the point of Operation Aware is to try to give some kids some values and to also teach them that they don't have to be part of a group and that they don't have to go along with something that looks like it's romantic or that it looks like it's exciting. They're trying to steer kids away from that. They're trying to give them more of a sense of individuality. That's my comment on your question. Does anybody else want to take that? Well, as far as I'm concerned, our public education um, type programs that we do for elementary schools, junior high, high schools, and so forth, we deglamorize the drug scene entirely. And we focus on the fact that it is a terrible physiological and psychological effect to young people as well as to adults. And we go through whatever type program we need to, we adapt it to that age group. So we certainly don't um, glamorize it at all. And we make it known to these young people that it's a serious problem for them. One final note on this, there was a proposal made yesterday uh, by the governor to start drug education starting in kindergarten and carrying it through high school. So that might be uh, one other way of dealing with the issue that you're raising here. Let's, know, let's go now to John at McGuire Air Force Base. Hello? Yes, John, go ahead. Yes, my question concerns uh, the difference between the addictive values of smoking pure cocaine versus smoking crack. I'm being told by an active user that... Uh, the pure cocaine is not as addictive as the crack. Dr. Torrance, would you comment on that? I can tell you what my patients tell me, which is that the most addictive form of any drug whatsoever that they've ever tried has been crack, or possibly freebase. Um, the high is rapid, more intense than anything else they've ever felt. Um, the uh, crash afterwards is uh, so uncomfortable and so rapid uh, that the urge to get back and use more is overwhelming. Uh, that's what my patients tell me. I've learned to listen to them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fears or Matt, you were agreeing with that. I think some of the people have also, that came out some of the Fair Oaks research, mm -hmm. it may not just be the chemical, it may be the root of administration. The, the smoking of it and the quick high also contributes mm -hmm. to that addiction. And I think that's a very good viewpoint. The way you take it besides what you're taking, not just the purity. And I think that was some very excellent research. We have a call now from Sandra on East Orange. Sandra, go ahead. Hello? Yes, Sandra, go ahead, please. Oh, uh, yeah. Earlier on, you mentioned, Mr. Fears, I think, mentioned where there are programs for smaller kids to start getting education on the addiction of drugs and so on. I'd like to get some information on where I could possibly get information on that. Mr. Fears? What we do at Fair Oaks Hospital is we design our programs for that age group, as I mentioned before, and somebody could contact 522-7000, which is the Fair Oaks Hospital number, and ask for our public relations department, and they would get in touch with the um, proper people to do an in-service of that kind for young people. All right, we have a phone call now from Jack in Philadelphia. Jack, go ahead. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, my name is Jack. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm in Philadelphia, and I'd like to know... Uh, Recently, there was a, uh, in the newspaper, the USA Today, a front page article by a researcher from the National Health Institute who are doing a doing, uh, uh, study on cocaine. And this researcher said that it was all right for some teenagers to use drugs. Uh, in other words, uh, he's giving them a green light to use drugs. Now, I know when I was, when I was drinking, I'd love to see those articles so that I could rationalize my drinking. Now, don't you think we should have some sort of moratorium by uh, the newspapers and so forth uh, to stop putting articles like that in the press? That's well, all I want to know. Well, what you're talking about there, Jack, is uh, censorship. I don't think anybody would uh, advocate that. I think there has to be a... Uh, um, responsibility exercised by the press, of course. I don't think anybody here would agree with saying, with telling kids that they can use drugs or any other substance, uh, but I think that's a matter that's going to have to be left up to the uh, individual and their editors. Dennis in, Dennis in Atlantic City, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Dennis. I'm from Atlantic City, um, and I just wanted to make a comment about the view that seems to be taken by your documentary. Uh, I don't disagree with it, yet I feel that Cocaine has been so glamorized, not just by um, this education program that you have now, but by um, sports figures, um, various celebrities, and, and, and upper echelon places. And, 
And I think that that influence that that they have on children and and children using them as role models uh, seems to be a real um, a real problem. And and I don't I don't really think that uh, your documentary has really focused in on that. And I'm wondering if there's any comments at all that you can make on that. Well, I think the the main point of my documentary was to deglamorize the drug. I don't think you saw anything in this whole piece that uh, did anything to glamorize it. Uh, I did not get into the sports figures. I wanted to keep this uh, confined to the drug problem here in New Jersey. But I think you're right. I think there is a problem when you do have uh, young people who see athletes uh, with cocaine problems, but by the same token, when you see uh, deaths of such people like Len Bias, that uh, I think that also can shake people up. I, uh, Nathan, I understand the hotline up in Fair Oaks, uh, right after Mr. Bias's death, uh, the calls went up dramatically. Tremendously. And um, one of the things we try to focus on is that we deglamorize this at all, at all times. And I think that a lot of athletes and a lot of celebrities are now trying to deglamorize this also. You see a lot of anti-drug campaigns on television and on the radio. And so people are becoming aware of this as a problem, and they're trying to focus in different areas instead of glamorizing these drugs. We have a call now from Aaron in Patterson. Aaron, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead, Aaron. Hello? Aaron, you're on the line. Go ahead. Uh, why is some crack is so dangerous? Why is crack so dangerous? Yeah. That's your question. Okay. Um, Dr. Torrance, why don't you take that one? It's um, real cheap. It's real available. You don't have to have a lot of money to get high. Um, you don't have to travel far to get it. You get real high. Other kids tell you that it's okay to do it, uh, and other kids don't tell you that it can really hurt you. All right, we have a call now from Kenneth in Philadelphia. Go ahead, Kenneth. Hello? Go ahead, Kenneth. You're on the line. Uh, yeah, um, my name is uh, Kenneth, and um, I am a recovering addict on the <coughs> Free Medical Center. My question is, <coughs> what exactly can cocaine do to the heart and the brain? Dr. Torrance, that's a medical question. Go ahead. Yeah, that is a medical question. <laughs> um, it's a stimulant. Uh, it basically pumps up both the heart and the brain. And uh, the problem is that it pumps it up at the expense of uh, the balanced functioning of the heart and the brain. And that can only go on so long as the tragic death of Len Bias uh, pointed out. All right, we have a call now from Gladys in Staten Island. Go ahead, Gladys. Uh, good evening. Uh, my question is, as a mother now, but before, uh, many years ago, my older brother, he started using drugs, and we never knew until it was too late. We had gone through a lot of trouble with him. But now I'm a mother, and I would like to know, how can I find out before it's too late, like it happened to us at home? Uh, being a mother, you worry, I mean, that the child comes from tired, you know, I don't want to get confused that he comes from tired from playing football or just studying, stuff like that. I don't want to go to the child and say, okay, you're on drugs, why are you taking? I don't want that. I want to find out, uh, how can I say, before I actually jump on his throat and, you know, say, you're, do, you're using this, but he's not. So how can you please let us know, as parents, how to be aware that Dad, the child you want to take that? I already feel that you are aware and as a mother, you do see a great deal. You have to kind of shift out or sift out what the adolescent is going through as an adolescent and with, with drugs itself. You're going to see many signs, but I think you also have to be open and honest within the family. Communicate and express your fears at different times to your, your son or daughter, who else it may be. And that's about, you can't really have a magic solution to it. You just have to use some of the ordinary parental skills and observations. Communicate and bring it up. If you think bring there's it up. a problem, and bring it up. And even confront at times. I mean, you may have to do that. All right, thank you. We have a call now from Joyce in Philadelphia. Go ahead, Joyce. Yes, good evening. My question to you is, it seems to be that they make it separate crack and cocaine. Now, from my understanding, crack is a derivative of cocaine. What I'd like to know is they are, it is one thing. It is cocaine, correct? It is cocaine, correct. yes. Okay, well, why is it such a big deal with the freebasing and, uh, and if they make a crackdown and this and that, and they make it separate issues? It's not a separate issue. It's one issue. It's cocaine. 
abuse. It is cocaine and it is abuse, but I think, uh, as these gentlemen have pointed out, and also I think as was pointed out in the documentary, the, the high that people get from, from crack is so instantaneous and the low is so tremendously down that people just really crave it. it it's much more addictive. Uh, Mr. Fears, I noticed you're shaking your head. Yes. Yes, it is much more addictive, and it's just the way, the form that the cocaine is administered. Um, people that are using crack are, are smoking, then it's going straight to the brain. And so the intense high is much more at a rapid pace than someone who is, say, um, snorting cocaine. All right, we have a call now from John in Westchester. Go ahead, John. Yeah, how can I tell if my son is on crack? How can you tell if your son is on crack? Uh, who wants to take that question? Why don't you? Mm, I'll try, try to address that. It's just um, the same awareness as you would have with any chemical, whether it's alcohol, whether it's marijuana, whether it's cocaine, whether it's crack. You have to look for a lot of symptoms. You have to be aware of your son's behavior, if that behavior has changed, if there's any um, drastic weight changes, whether it's a loss in weight or increase in weight, whether there's an increase in appetite, um, mood fluctuations, different type of behavior. Um, a new group of peer associations, poor grades in schools, and things of that nature. And you have to constantly be aware and monitor what your son or daughter is doing. Okay. Uh, we have a call now from Arlene in Philadelphia. Go ahead, Arlene. Good evening. I'd like to know if there is a medical use for cocaine, and if so, if not, how did its use first come about? Dr. Torrance? There is a um, medical use for cocaine. Uh, it is a very effective uh, local anesthetic for uh, numbing membranes for surgical procedures in the nose and mouth. Uh, and it also constricts blood vessels so that uh, surgical work can be done in those areas. It also has the effect of making uh, people high. And uh, it tends not to be used medically much anymore because it's uh, very hard to control um, the drug in a hospital without having it stolen. In terms of kids who are, uh, who take the drug, try to get off the drug, and a lot of the time they go back to using the drug again, what is, what is the key for, for the user who wants to get off? Uh, don't the, is it something that they really have to make up their own mind that they want to quit? Dr. Torrance? Well, I was, I was really impressed in a documentary um, uh, with James, who somehow uh, was presented with uh, an atmosphere where he felt he could go to a counselor and initially make some effort to reach out for help. I think parents who um, present an opening to their child to speak up if uh, he or she is troubled uh, offer the kid that same opportunity. Um, Sometimes uh, the kid is just too sick to be willing to volunteer, though, and sometimes it becomes necessary to step in and say, you really need to do uh, what is good for you. And then one has to be firm, as you heard uh, Jamie, uh, James's mother, say, uh, also in the documentary, about setting limits and sticking to them even though it really hurts. When we have patients come into our rehab program, um, the bottom line, I guess, is nobody really volunteers for rehab. Everybody's forced into it by his or her disease or legal consequences or financial consequences or losing family. Uh, we don't expect people uh, to have to volunteer for it completely at first in order to work well. Um, and some of our uh, best outcomes come from people who initially were quite resistant. But they need to be presented with firm limits. Okay, let me interrupt you here. We have a phone call now from Philadelphia. Stan in Philadelphia, go ahead. Stan, are you there? Stan? All right, Mike in Philadelphia. We have another call from Philly. Mike? Uh, hello. Uh, my question is, what would you do in uh, case someone you knew had a seizure uh, from cocaine? What would you, what would uh, you do? Call the hospital or is there some medicine you can give them or what should you do? What should you, that sounds again like a medical question. <laughs> that does sound like a medical question again. I think uh, the first thing to do is make sure that they're in a safe place. If they're having a seizure at the head of a flight of stairs or while they're uh, at the wheel of a moving automobile, I mean, it's fairly obvious you need to step in and get them safe right at the moment and in a place where if they throw up, uh, they won't uh, choke on that. 
and then uh, uh, arrange in some way to get them to a hospital as soon as possible. It certainly is true that people experienced with drug abusers know that sometimes people can do okay after a seizure, but you never really know if a buddy who you've been doing drugs with is having a seizure, whether it's the same old seizure that you might have seen before or whether this is really something else and much more serious. So it really needs to get to a hospital as soon as possible. We have another call now from uh, Philadelphia. Mike in Philadelphia, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a recovering uh, alcoholic and drug addict, and uh, I was wondering, uh, when I first started drinking, you know, uh, that led up to uh, doing drugs, and uh, I was wondering if anybody else feels like uh, it's a progressive disease. Like, uh, you could start off with drinking, and then I just wanted to get another kind of high, and uh, I went right into drugs, like marijuana, and that leading me up to cocaine and all. And uh, I was wondering if anybody there feels the same way. Mr. Fierce, you are in charge yeah, of the accept unit at Fair Oak, so. It's definitely a progressive disease. I think um, out of the majority of patients that we have at our program at Fair Oaks Hospital, all the young people experimented initially and started with something like a, a can of beer or a marijuana cigarette. And that progressed to the point of them using cocaine, to the point of them using um, quaaludes, to the point of them taking LSD and things of that nature. So it definitely is a progressive disease. We have a call now from Pam in Delaware. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, I would like to know, um, I have a friend, and she's on cocaine. Okay, um, I've done all I could to help her. And um, she keeps telling me she's going to stop. She's going to stop. Okay, right now I'm in the position that I am very tired of her knocking on my door. Now, I've done all I can, and she promised me she would get help. So the only thing I can, I take her to these places, we, we go all through the procedures, but then it goes, she goes back. Now, I'm tired, and, you know, I have a life to live. I mean, she is my friend, but I can't take it no more. So what can I do? How do you help your friend, Mr. Martin? I think you're going through what a lot of drug counselors are actually going through right now. It's a very tiring process. It does take a, a lot of frustrations out of you. It just, it's, it's just trying to deal with a person and motivate them again and again. And I think you almost have to go back and try to help that person. We receive so many calls now on people looking for residential care. It doesn't really exist as it should. And so I ask them to talk to a local counselor, even just talk on the phone for some some reinforcement. That's all I'm going to say to you right now. You really have to go back and help that person. That's what drug work is all about. Um, there, are, there are a lot of failures, but there are a lot of successes, too. I think one thing that people should keep in mind, too, is that you can look in the phone book for things like Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous, and they might be able to also lend a hand. Yes. Uh, we have a call now from Linda in Carteret. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah, I was just wondering, if a child is using cocaine or crack, how long would it be in his system that they could do a urine test to show that it would show up? Dr. Torrance? Our experience is that um, it will generally be in the system reliably for about three days. Sometimes, if it's been a very high dose, it can be longer than that. But somebody who's just having their urine checked twice a week, uh, for example, uh, rapidly learns when they can use Coke so that it doesn't show up in their test. Our next call is from Jackie in Philadelphia. Go ahead, Jackie. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask the doctor. Um, I was wondering, have they done any studies on uh, genetically how crack affects people? Um, I don't think that there's any evidence at this point uh, that is solidly established that the use of crack causes genetic defects. That's too early a drug right now, right? What about the research, the initial research on cocaine use was, shows that it also affects, as we saw in the piece, uh, young infants. Uh, but has there been any further research on this to, that, that links cocaine with any other, uh, say, genetic breakdowns or anything in, in, a, in small children? Uh, you mean if it causes birth defects? Yes. Um, Again, it's, it's pretty early. Uh, I think your documentary showed what we know so far. Mm -hmm. Realize also we only learned about fetal alcohol syndrome as about 12 years ago, and now uh, people are looking at the other drugs, seeing if that same progression, whether it's tobacco or illegal mm -hmm. drugs, is there. I mean, a lot of that is new research, and mm -hmm. I think it's exciting research, frightening too. 
We have a call now from Tanya and Rockaway. Go ahead. Tanya and Rockaway, go ahead. Are you there? All right. Mr. Fears, when the kids come into Fair Oaks Hospital up in Summit, what kind of shape are they in? Uh, we heard Dr. Torrance say earlier that uh, when nobody really wants to go in for a rehabilitation program, they're just almost being forced to be there. Does that make your job in terms of rehabilitation or anybody trying to do a rehab that much tougher? Well, it makes it very difficult. Most of the young people that come in certainly don't come in out of their own admission of having a chemical dependency problem or by wanting to be in treatment. They're normally forced into treatment through the courts, through their families, through the schools, saying that we will not accept you back in school until you do something about this problem, um, through the referral of a friend where they've lost all their um, positive peer associations or something of that nature. And these kids are very much into extreme denial. And we have to break through that denial system. And one of the biggest problems is breaking through self-denial as well as family denial. All right. We're starting to run out of time for our program here. We are going to take a few more phone calls. But after this program closes, I want people to know that there are other phone calls that you can call if you've got a problem or if someone else has a problem. There are a couple of numbers that you can call. One is the cocaine hotline, which is up in Summit, New Jersey. Their number is 1-800-COCAINE. That number, again, is 1-800-COCAINE. Another number you can call is run by the New Jersey Drug Hotline. That's operated by Together Incorporated. They're in Glassboro. Their number is 1-800-225-0196. That's 1-800-225-0196. Now, if you have further inf if you would like some more information about this subject, you can contact us here at the New Jersey Network. You can send the, the address is Cocaine Kids, NJN, 1573 Parkside Avenue. That's in Trenton, New Jersey, 08625. That's Cocaine Kids, NJN, 1573 Parkside Avenue, Trenton, New Jersey. We have some other information that we can share with you, and we'll be happy to do that. All right, we have a call now from Lenore in Patterson. Yes, hello. Um, I want to know what can we do about the drugs being sold right in front of our schools? Mr. Martin? Well, I believe the governor addressed that yesterday, and um, Mayor Graves of Patterson has also addressed that. They are talking about some very, very stiff penalties for the selling within a thousand, thousand yards, I believe it is, from the school, but also some long-term penalties for those selling to children or in schoolyards. I think that legislation will pass in this state, and I think it's badly needed because we talk about protecting our young. And one other point, if you see something like that going on, uh, you shouldn't hesitate to call your local police department. Uh, we're starting to run out of time. I want to take, thank Dr. Philip Torrance, Nathan Fears of Summit Hospital, and Matt Martin from the Health Department. We will continue to take calls now. Uh, Shirley in Wilmington, you have another uh, question for us? Go ahead. I want to know, when did crack first start? I mean, when did it start being noticeable? Mr. Martin? Well, it was documented about two years ago in California. It seems like everything starts in California, but New York City documented just about a year ago, and New Jersey just the beginning of this year. So it's been around longer than two years, but really the heavy use of it in California two years ago. So it really is a so-called new drug. Are there any signs on the street that the use of crack is abating at all? No, not really. It's probably too early right now, and I, in California it's not even abating right now. They're talking about designer drugs.